we're continuing our coverage here from an icy cold Davos. Joining me is TV Narendran of Tata Steel. Thank you very much for joining us My on pleasure. CNBC TV 18. What does the outlook look like as far as your sector is concerned in 2017? Do you anticipate a pickup in demand in 2017? Uh, globally or in India? In India specifically. In India, uh, certainly we expect 2017 to be better than 2016. Uh, in fact, the second half of 2016, uh, things started improving. And we expect uh, with the government's focus on infrastructure expenditure and hopefully a lot more coming in in the budget, mm. we expect that the sector construction in India will pick up. We will uh, ride over the challenges uh, of the last couple of months on demonetization. Mm -hmm. So I expect How much 2017. has demonetization impacted business for you so far? Uh, directly for Tata Steel, not much, because a uh, lot of our business, or almost all of our business, uh, was on electronic uh, transactions anyways. It was just the final leg of uh, the retailer to consumer in our distribution business which got impacted. Got impacted in November. We worked with the State Bank of India to provide some 10,000 point of sale stations uh, uh, in uh, India with our distribution network. Uh, so we got over that. Uh, some of our customers, the auto industry for instance, got affected. But I think they are also getting out of that. So I think uh, the effect is temporary and uh, the gain should be more permanent, I guess. So can you quantify for us when you say that it's expected to be a better year, 2017 versus the previous year? In terms of demand, can you quantify the kind of uptick that you anticipate? Uh, typically, in a developing country, the uh, demand growth in steel should mirror the GDP growth. In India, it's been a bit lower uh, because it's been a consumption-led growth rather than an investment-led growth. Uh, this year, the expectation is 5 to 6%. Uh, next year, we expect it to be at least that, if not more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the government intervened by way of uh, safeguard duties and the MIP and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, that provided the much-needed protection that the Indian steel industry was looking for. Uh, but globally now, as you look at what's happening in China, uh, what is the sense that you get? And the other markets that you operate in as well, uh, you know, what's the outlook, for instance, in Southeast Asia and for exports? Uh, these actions by the government of India was very timely and helpful in the early part of 2016. Uh, because we were coming out of uh, 2015 where the steel prices had dropped very significantly and exports from some of the countries had grown. Uh, that did help us, that gave us the support, that gave us uh, some comfort for a few months. But international prices started picking up, mm. you know, so, and that is reflected in the fact that India is now back to being a big exporter of steel, you know, and you wouldn't be able to export steel if you were not competitively mm. priced. Mm. So the uh, rising coking coal and iron ore prices and the rising international prices, both of which are correlated, uh, helped uh, change the price equation totally. So mm -hmm. the MIP, while it helped us for a few months, uh, the international prices went above the MIP and mm -hmm. Indian steel producers started exporting. Uh, so I think we are back to a more normal playing field and uh, mm. so uh, we appreciate... So what is the outlook then in terms of exports? In terms of exports, well, India is already exporting, I think, about seven, 800,000 tons a month. India is going to be a net exporter of steel, which is good, rightly so, because India has the raw materials, mm. very efficient producers, so why not? Mm. In terms of global markets, uh, last year, I think uh, if I look at 2016, China and Russia were not as bad as we thought it would be. You know, I'm not saying that uh, the steel consumption grew there, but it did not shrink as much as uh, the World Steel Association had anticipated. Uh, the U.S. was a bit of a disappointment in 2016. Uh, going forward next year, we expect the trend to continue in China and uh, Russia. Things are improving. What is the latest now, uh, you know, whether it's Thyssen Group or the conversations with the UK government on pension liabilities? Where do things currently stand? I know it's not, <laughs> not entirely your remit, yeah. uh, but, but give us a sense of what no, we should I, expect. Yeah, I think as you rightly said, probably Kaushik or Hans are the better guys to answer that. But the conversations are going on with the British government. The British pension is an important part of the conversation. Uh, the discussions with Thyssen are also going on. UK is a very important part of the Thyssen discussions. So let's see. We are hopeful that in the next few months we will find some solutions. So it will still take another few months? It should. So is that two, three, six? I wouldn't uh, comment on that. You wouldn't comment on that. <laughs> Too many moving parts. Uh, you know, uh, and I, I don't want to get into the details of what has transpired post the 24th of October. Uh, the, the only reason I intend to talk to you about it is because operating companies were in that sense dragged into the bitter boardroom battle. Tata Steel was one of them, where the former chairman has said that certain strategic decisions were uh, not right for the company, that it's in, in a sense weighed on growth for the company. What has this meant for you within Tata Steel? How are you addressing some of the questions that have been raised, not just by Cyrus Mr but also people like Nasli Valia. I, I wouldn't want to comment on what happened inside the boardroom. I think uh, uh, what I would just say is that uh, as a company, 
we uh, stuck to uh, what we were supposed to do. I think Mr. Tata, when he spoke to us the day after the event, told the managements of companies to focus on the businesses and make sure that the businesses went on as normal. And I think that's what we did as Tata Steel. The team uh, rallied around and we continued to do what we were supposed to do. And uh, the uh, least number of people who needed to be distracted by this were distracted and most of the people continued life as normal. Mm. But one of the issues that was raised there, and of course that had more to do with the chorus acquisition, is that the focus ought to have been more on the domestic markets because India is the growth story as opposed to international. As you look ahead, and given the fact that we are now seeing well, the economy is slowed, but it's still six and a half or perhaps seven percent. Uh, you know, do you believe that the strategic focus ought to be on the domestic business? Well, uh, for any business, you would tend to focus on where you uh, make most of your money. The Indian business is uh, one of the best places globally from a competitiveness point of view. It's one of the most profitable businesses in the steel industry in the world. So, rightly so, you would focus on it. And I think the Tata Steel Board has uh, focused on it. If you look at it between 2007 and uh, 2015, the capacity in India grew from something like 6 million tons to now it is 13 million tons. So mm. it's more than double. Mm. You know, so we've invested uh, something like 40, 45,000 crores in India in growing capacity. So we are a 13 million ton uh, player in India. And, uh, uh, you know, so I think we have not, uh, in some sense, uh, we have not been, uh, we've not been denied any investments. Mm. Uh, I think as long as there was a business case for it, we should also remember that post-2008, uh, things were looking bad for everyone across the world, mm. right? So uh, I think we went ahead with our investments. What slowed us down in Kalinganagar was less to do with the capital available, less to do with uh, issues on the ground, which mm. we sorted out. Mm. And as soon as we sorted out those issues, we built capacity very fast. Mm. So I think we will continue to invest and grow in India. In fact, uh, we had actually made a lot of announcements in the mid-2000, between 2003 and 2005, about mm. investing and growing in India. Mm. But I think in India, particularly if you're looking at greenfield sites, it takes some time. Mm. It's not easy. It's mm. not just about starting mm. construction when you mm. want to, but about building equity with local communities. Mm. That takes time. Mm. And that's what we did in Kalinganagar. So it took us a while, but now we are set for between Kalinganagar and Jamshedpur. We have the land and the facilities to be able to grow much more. Mm. So you don't need to add any more capacity. What can we then expect as no, far we, as investment? We will, uh, I think as long as there's a business case for mm -hmm. it, uh, we will continue to look at growing uh, capacity in India. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what kind of investments are we then talking about? So it again depends. Uh, we've said uh, already that we're going to go board in the next few months with a proposal to take Kalinganagar from the current 3 million to 8 million. Uh, so but that's uh, subject oh, to the board. Period? Well. Uh, if we get the board to uh, agree to the proposal in the next few months, then it's uh, three to four years from now. Okay. Yeah. And what, what would that entail in terms of incremental investments? Incremental investments, uh, you know, would be less than what we spent in the first uh, phase because in the first phase we had to build a lot of enabling facilities, uh, a lot of the investments in building the infrastructure around the plant. So it would be much less. I wouldn't want to give you a number just mm -hmm. now, but uh, a thumb rule typically for any uh, steel investment is a billion dollars, a million tons. Uh, this would be less than that. Okay. What is the pricing outlook? Because you were just talking about uh, how we've actually seen prices move up. As you look forward to 2017, uh, you know, what is the sense that you get in terms of prices and where they head? Well, uh, what has happened in the second half of 2016 is uh, iron ore and coal prices went up much uh, more than anyone ever anticipated. Uh, since then, the coal prices have dropped off a bit. Iron ore prices are still holding strong. But even at today's uh, coal prices and today's iron ore prices, uh, I think uh, there's a disconnect between the steel price and the input prices, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I would say at today's coal and iron ore prices, steel price should at least be $50 higher, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to come to a balance uh, if you look at a long-term balance. Mm -hmm. uh, with Chandra now moving to uh, the chairman's position at Tata Sons, uh, is it fair to assume that he will take over as chairman of Tata Steel as well? He's joined the board of Tata Steel just now and uh, the board of Tata Steel is meeting in the first week of February and the Board of Tata Steel will decide. Mr. Narendran, always yeah. a pleasure speaking yeah. with you. Thank you very much Thank for you your Shree. time. Nice and to meet you. And we wish you the very best of luck. Thank you.